Good afternoon, everybody. I am, uh, for the second time, nominated as a moderator on this stage. Uh, I'm very proud of that. My name is Mons Lugetsoft. I am the president of the United Nations General Assembly. And it's a privilege and honor to have Princess Sara Said here at the stage, one of the UN advocates. Uh, we just agreed upon being together the youth. Yes. Yes. Uh, and tell me why that's necessary, Princess. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very, very much for having me. I am deeply honored to have been asked to, to come and, uh, and to sit uh, and to discuss with you. Um, you. We feel youthful. I think that, you know, yes. I mean, youth, youth are at the heart of every conversation that we have to have. Um, and, um, uh, and so long as we are youthful at heart, I hope that that means that we can, that we can uh, add a, a real contribution. Um, but particularly when you look at uh, so many of the countries that I'm interested in, um, the countries where there is, uh, there is crisis or fragility or uh, humanitarian conflicts, um, the majority of the populations are young. And uh, we have this enormous cohort of youth uh, that, is, that is growing up in a very unstable world. And one of the most important things that we can do is to make sure that their rights are protected and, uh, and that they have access to the quality health and education and um, that, they're, that we're going to give them something, that, that they will inherit a world where, um, where they can live fruitful lives but that also we don't neglect them whilst they're growing up surrounded by uh, fragility. Of course, I totally agree. And I think we may congratulate each other with this day of achievements because the climate agreement will, of course, not solve all these challenges. But if we don't make it, I think we will, be, uh, we will not be able to reach anything of the basic humanitarian goals we have presented for the future, eradicating hunger, creating, uh, uh, eradicating poverty, creating education mm -hmm. uh, for this enormous hundreds of millions of young people mm -hmm. in this world. Uh, so, so we are one step forward, but there is a lot, lot to do. Uh, and uh, you have been now, the, uh, for some time, the advocate for, for, for women and children uh, of the UN. Uh, what have you experienced in, in, in this work of yours? Well, um, my uh, principal role, and, um, uh, and I, was just, I was just trying to describe the job that, uh, that I do, um, and that is in Dr. Doolittle, there's a two-headed llama called the Pull You Push You. Um, and that is what my principal job is, I feel, <laughs> is, to, is to pull and push and, mm -hmm. and to speak out as loudly as I can um, on, on, as, uh, on issues. Um, and um, the, um, the Millennium Development Goals were tremendous. They were a beginning. And, um, but they were, not, they were not the end and they did not adequately address humanitarian settings. Uh, and so we have to learn from that as we look towards um, uh, the SDGs and how we're going, to, we're going to secure progress, how we're going to protect the investments that we've already made, um, and how we're going to do better for more. Um, the um, Secretary General in 2010 uh, created the Every Woman, Every Child movement because it was recognized that the MDGs that were doing uh, the least that had the least chance of, of succeeding food, food, yeah. were um, in women and children's health, the health MDGs. And so uh, Every Woman, Every Child was created, and it's underpinned by this um, technical document, the Global Strategy for Women and Children's Health. Um, and, and it did do tremendous things, uh, you know, brought together a huge community, um, and, uh, which marched towards making um, women and children's lives better saving lives, um, empowering women and girls. Um, along comes SDGs, and, uh, and so um, the global strategy was such a success that it's been rebooted so that it aligns for the next 15 years with the, uh, sorry, 30 years for the Sustainable Development Goals. And so my job was to integrate 
the health of um, women, children, newborns and adolescents in humanitarian and fragile settings into this massive development juggernaut so that we would actually have the chance to plan over multiple years, to finance over multiple years and to make sure that, uh, that we really do have a way to reach um, the often forgotten women and, and children. If we, want to, um, if we want to be true to every woman, every child, if we want to be true to, um, uh, to going the furthest first, that is in conflict. That is in the heart of, uh, of a besieged area. That is in the heart of the drought um, in northern India at the moment. Um, and, uh, and it is always women and children that, um, that are hit first and where the, the repercussions are in every aspect of their lives. Yes. Yes, and, and, and you are, of course, well aware of there was this uh, United Nations uh, group of people uh, uh, working out the humanitarian financing report that mm -hmm. was presented in Dubai in January. I was there together with the Secretary General and other people. What, what it says is basically that we have 120 million people in need of better humanitarian relief and basic services and education and health. Mm. Uh, half of them being displaced or refugees, half of them having a temporary need uh, for support because of drought or any mm. other nat natural catastrophe. Uh, and, and, and it's very, very obvious in that report also, as you say, that the women and the children are the most affected. It's very, very obvious that when we talk about the Sustainable Development Goals and eradicating extreme poverty, an increasing part of the, uh, rest, uh, the rest of extreme poverty in this world is in the conflict-affected areas, mm. uh, uh, which unfortunately are growing mm. in size and, and uh, dimension. But so too are the informal settlements. The way that the system was designed originally was um, uh, in humanitarian settings focused on rural areas, focused on refugees in camps. Yeah. Now, it's urban settings. It is, um, it is uh, IDPs, it is refugees, it is populations on the move that are becoming embedded in informal settings. Yes. And this is a whole new area that we have to that we have to be um, responsive to and fast. Um, uh, everything is changing around us so rapidly and, uh, and, and we have to move just as rapidly if we're going to, if we're going to, um, if we're going to serve the people that, that, that we work for. Uh, this is, you know, we're not going to do any of this um, and we shouldn't be sitting on this stage unless we, we look for um, the people that are missing. Yeah. But don't you think that it has been really lack of attention and foresight in the rich countries that they didn't see, for instance, in the broader Middle East, the refugee crisis uh, developing and the need for support for those countries like Jordan and Lebanon, uh, which has proportionally received the largest amount of, of refugee population. Is it region. fair for you to ask me that question? Yes, I think <laughs> I so. Be doing it the other way but then, I, uh, <laughs> then, then I would answer yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, look, the, the, um, uh, yes, I mean, I was in, um, I worked for UNICEF in Iraq. And uh, the last time I was, I left Iraq in, in 2000. Um, Iraq had 13 years of the most comprehensive sanctions uh, that any country has ever had to live with. The sanctions broke the back of Iraq, broke the back of the middle class, broke the back of the electricity, the oil industry. Um, it, it created divisions within the country between the South Center, the Central and, and the Northern governorates. Yeah. And, uh, and everything that we're seeing today you can look back and, uh, and see some of the origins of this. Um, the three largest uh, areas where we have refugees coming from, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, 
these aren't surprises. You know, these crises didn't happen yesterday. Um, and um, uh, and quite often, I think that we live in we live in a, a very um, um, we, we live in a denial that suits ourselves until it serves our purpose to pay attention to them. Um, you know, we have to look forwards as well. If we have peace in Syria, um, what do you think is going to happen then? What, what happens when we, we have peace in Syria? Suddenly you have this enormous country that has been absolutely decimated yeah. by five years of conflict. We've done so well with our rebuilding of, of Iraq and other countries. Uh, do we know any more about how we're going to, to assist the Syrian populations, how we're going to continue to, to assist the countries around Syria, how many more people we're going to see going into Europe? Have we, have we sort of started to think this through? Have we learned from, from our efforts of the past? Um, and I should probably say at this stage that I do not represent the Jordanian government, the mission, <laughs> or, or OHCHR. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but... but. But, but, but Jordan, uh, I, then I can try to do that because Jordan is is having uh, a an increase in population by one fourth within Absolutely. very few years. Absolutely. And, and it, it's obvious that no country, even a much much richer country, could manage that challenge without support from mm. outside. It's quite obvious. And uh, in some ways, Jordan is uh, is is very fortunate um, because Jordan has a Zatari. Um, and uh, and it's easy it's it's easy to see Zatari. You know, you the the when when you read about the refugee crisis, it's often Zatari yeah. that you see pictures of. Um, and uh, on an almost daily basis, there's a delegation yeah. of, of foreign officials that go to Zatari. Um, and uh, and so there is a lot of attention. Um, it, Jordan has a very global voice because of its leadership and so it has that sort of outreach. Um, there are other countries that don't have that and um, uh, certainly the, the IDPs that have gone up into northern Iraq, we don't hear their voices. I can't actually tell you in almost anything about what is happening with IDPs in northern Iraq because they don't have a voice. Or the millions of, of refugees the millions, in Yemen. The which, millions of refugees in Yemen, yeah. in uh, around Nigeria and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so on. The, the average amount of time to be a refugee is 20 years. Yeah. 20 years is not a crisis. For a, a woman, 20 years can be my entire reproductive cycle from being born going through adolescence and puberty and having a child myself. And, um, and so as a system to, to become better at, at looking where we've been and looking to where we're going and to understanding the individual needs and that if my individual needs are not met, that I as a woman will not be participating. I won't be at the table negotiating peace. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and my children will not be um, receiving the benefits that, that they do from an empowered woman. Sorry, I went on a... I brought us back to women. Uh, <laughs> I was trying I think, to be nifty and yeah, take but, us but, back again. <laughs> I think we are there where we want some questions from the audience, if there are any. So long as it's not about Syrian reconstruction, I think we're all right. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Andalib Shah, and I run an initiative out here in the U.S. called Techfugees. And we uh, believe in using technology, bringing the uh, agility and innovation of the technology world um, to address the refugee crisis. And so we'd like to work with agencies on the ground. I'd love to hear your opinion on how you think technology uh, plays a role in, in camps like Zatari and, and um, you know, what would, what would you say is the role of technology and the importance of technology? Um, uh, technology is, is the way forwards and, um, and we are all so interconnected now thanks to, um, uh, thanks to our handheld media devices and, and means of, of communicating. Um, uh, and you can see, particularly with the Syrian crisis, the real impact that that has 
has had, well, first of all, you can go back to the beginning of the Arab Spring and you can, and you can see the impact that social media had. And then now with the Syrian crisis, um, it's through the means of communication, that is, is how people have got their information, not necessarily from the international community or, uh, um, I don't think that we've been terribly good about providing uh, information, but, but through social media, uh, is how people have found out that there's a better world out there. Uh, and um, it's also, from a health point of view, uh, a means of um, reaching out to uh, communities that are far away, uh, telling them about, uh, helping to inform them and to build uh, knowledge and capacity around basic health needs, what signs to look for if a woman is bleeding um, or children's needs about vaccines, these sorts of things. Um, something that, that I've become very interested in recently is um, trauma um, and the impact on women of uh, the stresses that they, they go through. Uh, and we're speaking recently with the head of the um, mental health department in the government of, of Lebanon. Um, and he was talking about how handheld devices might be used to help um, address PTSD. Because if you can, if you think about um, the populations that we know of on the move going through Europe at the moment, um, what they must have suffered, what they must have endured. Can you imagine putting your children on a boat knowing that your children can't swim, knowing that you're going to get somewhere where you're not really wanted, to a language that you don't speak, and then you're just going to, you have a dream and you're just going to keep marching. How do we how do we help mothers, families to stay strong, to understand what's happening to them? How do we explain to children? You know, I think that um, the Sesame Workshop does these extraordinary outreach um, uh, around early childhood development and, um, and helping young people deal with, with trauma. Um, and, and so how do we use modern technology or information to help with all of the issues that people have to deal with? Last thing, though, is that we cannot forget the communities that don't have access, that um, uh, cell phones and so on are often very gendered. And so as a woman, I need to have a man's permission uh, to use it to, to have one. Um, or um, the women that are illiterate, you know, they are the last ones that we're going to hear from. And how do we reach out to them? Um, you know, we, go, we can go back to, to the radio or these sorts of things. We mustn't get carried away um, with, with technology and leave, keep leaving people behind. And that, I think, is, is what we often do. But of course, the, there are a lot of, of new or rather new technological tools you can use to provide electricity by solar cells mm. out in the faraway camps. Uh, to, to through that also provide education programs on screens and so on. There are a lot of things that are much easier and much cheaper to do Absolutely. actually than they were just a, f a few years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that connects a little to what the princess said about the uh, long longevity of being a refugee, which is very frightening. Mm -hmm. Very frightening. Uh, yeah, uh, that we, we have when we work with supporting the refugee communities have to understand that it is not just a relief action no. to bring food uh, and some basic education. It's about development programs mm -hmm. so that these people, uh, during their stay in the refugee situation, can do something productive, can mm -hmm. develop uh, uh, their own lives and, and the community. Mm -hmm. the, the temporary community they are leaving. Humanitarian funding is done in one-year cycles, and um, how can you how can you even begin to address issues if you're if you're having to work in one-year cycles yeah. and your mandate is to look at urgent needs, food, shelter, uh, basic sanitation, and so on. And what which one of you would would tolerate that? I mean. Us women in the room, we're incredibly lucky, but you've upset me, messed with my children, and by golly, you're going to hear about it. Um, uh, deny me access to, to a bathroom or to hygiene facilities, you are going to hear about it. But most people don't have that luxury. Uh, and, and to have to, to, to do that every single day, 
year after year after year. And this is what people are enduring all the time. And we, we seem not to care is the other thing. We seem, we, we dehumanize, we, uh, we get lost in numbers. Um, uh, we forget that, uh, that parents want the best for their children. You know, why is it that people um, run? Why is it that, that people stay? Why is it that women put themselves at risk because they, they need water for their families? Uh, they walk further every day. They put themselves into more danger because the water sources are getting further away. Um, uh, we do what we do for our, our families. And, um, and this isn't something that you can, you can hide behind numbers uh, or that we should be forgetting. Just one final note on this, and that's not to be lost in numbers, but what we learned from the humanitarian financing report is that what we need on this globe to give a decent basis for those in a refugee or catastrophic situation mm -hmm. is something extra between 15 and 20 billion dollars. Is that a lot of money? It corresponds to 25 cents out of each thousand dollars earned in this world. So it should be possible. Mm. And one of the most urgent tasks, I think, is in front of the General Assembly and the United Nations system is actually to mobilize the understanding that we need more funds mm. and we need more long-term mm. commitments to funding the humanitarian relief efforts. Mm. But if otherwise we are not able to deal with these problems in a decent way, we're not able to control the movements of people uh, in a decent way. Uh, so this is one of the most important issues on the agenda of the United Nations at the summit in Istanbul in May mm. and at the opening of the General Assembly uh, with, the, with the summit on, on refugees and, and migrants in the 19th of September. And um, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not just the money, it's what we do with it. Yeah, of course. And we, as a system, the international community, whether that be the, the donor community, the NGOs, the United Nations, um, we, have to, we have to rework the mechanisms and the partnerships and the way that we work. I think that that has to be our commitment to all of this. If, our, if, if the community will, will provide the funds, we will spend it better yep. and we will be more accountable uh, and, uh, and that we will keep women and children at the center. Right, let's stop at this note. Because there's Very a big important. zero over there. Yeah, we, we are kicked out now. But thank you very much, Princess. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you're all right. <laughs>